relatively new board. We just go around and introduce ourselves and let you folks also introduce yourselves so that everyone is familiar with who we have. Um, Ann Howard, Braintree. Ashley Lincoln, Randolph Center. I'm just a note taker. Not just, <laughs> You're just a note taker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Laura Rochelle from Brookfield. Ann Kaplan from Randolph. Paul Putney from Randolph. Lane Millington, Superintendent, and from Randolph. You guys want to introduce yeah. yourselves? Uh, I'm Zoe Marco with the Herald. I'm Jay Hooper. I represent the legislature as well as four other towns. Uh, it's my second year. I'm Jack Kling. Um, I live in Randolph and represent five towns as well. Mark McDonald, represent Orange County in the Senate. I'm Jeff Francis from the Vermont Superintendents Association. I'm Sue Siglowski from the Vermont School Boards Association. I'm the Director of Legal and Policy Services. Brian Baker, a resident of Brookfield. David White, Randolph. Thanks very much. All right, so um, today really the focus of our meeting is, is to, to hear from the legislators and, and the school boards association and the principals association. So we've invited you guys to start. And um, we know now we have a house rep on the education committee, which yeah, is great. <laughs> so uh, thank you. This week we've taken up, these actually past several weeks, we took up some rather controversial items, um, namely Act 46. Uh, to delay or to not delay is the question. Um, and for whom does that delay apply? Um, there was a Sherman Amendment basically asking for a, a blanket one year delay. That's the representative from Stowe. Um, we voted on that and got defeated by five votes. I think it's 69 to 74. Um, that I'll let Jeff Francis talk more about, but I, I'm going to say we were proud to pass H3, which was a bill to an act relating to ethnic and social equity study standards for public schools. So basically, asking the we created an advisory committee to recommend to the Board of Education where curriculums ought to be amended to fill in the gaps in terms of how we teach histories. So histories of uh, marginalized groups. So, so you know, tell the whole story. That was basically what we were, we're mandating a group to do the research as to what materials should be added to local curriculums. I mean, we can't, we can't say this is what we want in the curriculum in this state you know, it's not a top-down, it's, it's local control. So they, can, they will make recommendations to the Board of Education and they'll consider those changes. Hopefully they'll take them uh, seriously in about two or three years. So we were trying to hurry that through so that you know, those curriculums are changed sooner than later. And uh, you know, that was, we thought that was a pretty good bill. Uh, we were proud to pass that out. So that passed 140 to nothing. There's a lot to learn, and I've been drinking from a fire hose, as they say, but I'm, I'm certainly paying attention to getting a lot of what's being built. Next year, I'll. What's a good way to approach this? I could just follow up Jay's comments and give you a little overview. Um, when I sat down next to Senator Jim McDonald, I said, I'm not sure whether it's a good year or a bad year. This is the first time I think I've seen him since the General Assembly started. And um, that's an indication that there are not uh, really active money issues for education on the table yet. Normally, at this point in the session, there's been a fair amount of um, discussion around the education funding system, and there may still be. Um, but it's not where we have been spending our time uh, in the representation that we do for school board members and superintendents. Um, 
as Representative Cooper indicated, there's an interest this year in um, addressing what I refer to as the, the end of the Act 46 process. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's a real interest in addressing um, through uh, old ethnic studies and cultural awareness um, efforts to strengthen the state in terms of how we respond to the diversity in the state. Sue Siglowski from the School Boards Association is prepared to talk about that. And there's another major emphasis um, that Jay didn't refer to yet because the House hasn't taken any action on it, and that has to do with environmental safety in schools. And there's a big initiative that emerged um, in the Senate um, and also uh, in the administration around lead in um, drinking water in schools. Um, and there's bills this week that um, the House Education Committee is going to hear from on radon and environmental uh, health of schools overall. Um, I'll be pretty succinct about the H39, which is the Act 46 bill um, just as background and um, in, in this school district you're aware of it because uh, Orange Southwest Supervisory Union was one of the first supervisory unions to go through the Act 46 process. In fact, um, this system while it was a supervisory union was doing a lot in a unified manner. So in, in prior years when I'd come down here we would have conversations about how that was working in terms of the delivery of the um, education for the towns in, in your now school district, formerly supervisor union. But the issue was um, the process that was outlined in Act 46 to bring the unification of school districts to conclusion involved a state board order and, uh, and an effort to have the places that were being asked to unify, unified by July 1, 2019. The State Board issued its order on November the 28th. There were some communities that were um, very ready to uh, assume merged operations on uh, July 1, 2019, and there others were not. So if you consider the subset of places that were under State Board order, there was a lot of difference of opinion not only um, in the General Assembly, but also in the districts themselves about whether you should move forward. Um, it was not, it was, I would say Act 46 uh, was a pretty well-structured piece of legislation, but if there, was a, if there was an aspect of it that was not as clean as other elements of it, it was how you bring it to conclusion. And a lot of it had to do with what the state of readiness was, political controversy, Places that we're hearing that perhaps we don't want to merge or unify, and yet the intention of the bill was to see these places in a unified state. So, it was, so what was fascinating to us in terms of our professional associations, um, we were told that Act 46 would not be the subject of any action in the General Assembly this year, and the, and they, really there were two reasons. One, it was regarded as settled law. In other words, Act 46 was well established. And the other was there were at least three court cases um, that the General Assembly did not want to intervene on um, because the cases should be allowed to be settled on the merit of the respective cases. <coughs> Nevertheless, folks that were interested in more time um, and also potentially interested in never having to unify, despite what the law said, um, got a pretty strong foothold in the General Assembly and lo and behold, within two weeks of the session there was this bill. Um, so I thought that the navigation in the House was pretty good. Uh, Jay said that he was like drinking from a fire hose. I was in there to witness that. I would attest to that. There was a lot of inf information, a lot of um, disagreement, uh, a fair amount of um, political uh, elements to the conversation. It was. I had not really seen, in my experience working at the Superintendent Association, that dynamic uh, of a start to a session period because of because of the controversy associated with the law. Anyway, as he indicated, um, the proposal to provide a blanket extension to every district that had not yet completed their merger work 
um, was defeated on a very, very close vote. And then a, uh, an amendment passed that basically delineates the difference between districts that would move forward on July 1, 2019 and those who would have to July 1, 2020. And the main line of demarcation was how much work had, be done, had been done in preparation for the merger. So if there was a 706 study committee, if there were articles of agreement, if there was a vote, that is evidence that the communities had actually worked toward the July 1, 2019 date. Those are the districts that were selected to move forward on July uh, 1, 2019. Um, for places that had not uh, demonstrated that much work, they've been given under the House bill until July 1, 2020. Um, one of the comments that was frequently heard uh, in the State House was, well, you're, 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 you're penalizing the people that did the work and giving a break to those that did not. That's a perspective that um, I understand fully. My view has been that we need to be pragmatic in terms of getting the work done at the earliest possible um, phase because, and I'll pause after this, the places that have unified, this one included, are able to demonstrate um, attainment of the goals or toward the goals because the systems now operating at scale are working well in most places. So the goals, efficiency, student opportunity, transparency, and the processes and so on, are in fact coming to pass in the places that, uh, that are working as a single district. Um, Vermont is a state that where this kind of action will always be politically and operationally controversial. There's no dispute about that. But there's also no dispute about dramatic declines in enrollment and the fact that while we live in an era of equity, in places, there's a lot of disparity still in our education system, which is Act 46. Act 46 is intended to address that. Um, the Senate now has to take the bill up. It's not uh, clear, it's not apparent what action the Senate will take. I think that the early disposition that I heard from leaders in the Senate was that they wanted to see the law implemented too. So um, this bill is going to be taken up shortly. Um, in the Senate Education Committee. Um, where it goes, I'm not certain. We do know that uh, there's a court hearing in St. Albans this coming Friday in the afternoon. The potential exists for an injunction that would say everybody's going to get that delay until um, July 1, 2020. There's a potential for the judge to say um, there's not going to be any injunction. There's three cases, I think. Three cases? Three cases. It could be different action on different case because they're being argued in different ways. So, summary statement, it continues to be dynamic. Our interest is in supporting schools to close the work out. The House has now moved it over to the Senate. Remain to be seen. I would say you should um, be happy that you went through it early and are, are benefiting from a district operation rather than an SU operation. So more kind of a, a thought, and I may be way off the mark in terms of the thinking process here, but it seems like there should be some sort of carrot and stick attached to the legislation as it goes through. The whole purpose of that reform, it seems in Vermont, is equity. So you have all these districts that have consolidated, and in doing so, have provided significant savings to the state as a whole and to all the other towns that subsidize each other, because we all subsidize each other. Well, if these folks don't have to consolidate, consolidate for another year or two, they're not providing any efficiencies to those systems. They are still spending well, far and above and beyond those of us that have consolidated. Um, and because of that, we're paying more um, because of that decision. So I would just throw that out there. I don't know if the logic is correct, but it just seems to be a concern. So Senator McDonald's going to get a chance to vote on this, perhaps, if the bill moves from the House Edu Senate from the Senate Education <coughs> Committee. Uh, he can speak for himself. You know, well, you just... And I don't know if anybody brought that up. As you know, it was... Okay. Yeah, it was brought up at... Yeah. I mean, oh, it was yeah. brought up, yeah. Because it had nothing to do with whether they're ready or not. I'm not as concerned about that. It's just that some of us... Some of the towns have benefited yeah. from the savings that some of us have provided. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean... Have we? Sorry? See what savings? The savings are pretty apparent in a bunch of places. Um, whether, it, whether you see it in the overall growth in the Ed Fund, I think it's hard to... Uh, ascertain until everybody's there, but um, 
but you know there are there are supervisory unions that are now districts that are measuring that are you know they're measuring savings in terms of millions of dollars. Um, but one of the things that may prevent people from coming back when the time is up who still aren't prepared is okay. You're going to pay a, instead of you know getting a 33 percent subsidization, you know you're going to get much less than that. And yet you're going to have to carry a lot more of the local until you get this done. So just a suggestion. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's that those points were made in the testimony. Yeah. So that's that. I don't know. Uh, whether you want to go to the other two major pieces of legislation and then circle back. I'll be more succinct with one of those and then Sue's going to talk about the other. I actually have a question. Jeff. How confident are we that the 15th is our first court results? It's on the, it's on the, um, it's on the court docket in Franklin County for 1130 on, on uh, Friday morning. So whether the judge rules from the bench, I think, is an open question. Whether the judge determines that because the General Assembly is now involved, and one of the concerns about the General Assembly getting involved was that the court proceedings could be slowed as a result of that. Um, so there was a lot of downside to, to the action that the House took. Um, uh, but, you know, it's a democratic process, and people are entitled to propose what they proposed, and here we are. Um, lead, pan lead, lead in drinking water supplies. So there was a pilot that the state ran last year. Did, did you have any schools involved in that pilot? Uh, yes. Not for the lead. They, we did a pilot that looked at some of the cleaning agents to see if they were right. leaking into the water. Yeah, the yeah, PFAs. Yeah. So the so I think that there were 16 schools, but I'm not positive about that in the um, in the uh, testing of lead at the source within schools. So drinking fountains, sinks that are used for potable water, and so on and so forth. And there was a percentage of school districts that had um, lead found uh, above the EPA actionable level, which is 15 parts per billion. Um, so with a heavy emphasis, appropriate heavy emphasis on environmental safety, there's um, a lot of momentum, as I said, both on the part of the administration and uh, started in the Senate to get a lead testing program uh, in schools. Um, so the, I'll just give you the outline of the current proposal. So um, the current proposal, which is reflected in Senate Bill 40, um, uh, as it passed the Senate, would have every source of water that is outlet, faucets, and so on and so forth, tested um, at the expense of the state. So either the state lab or certified labs by the state would, would do all the samples. Um, there is, and that would be paid for by the state, that's the proposal. Um, where mitigation was required under the Senate proposal, the expectation would be that the state would pay 50% of the mitigation. Our association argued for 100% of the mitigation. We think it's a compelling public health need that's being initiated by the state. When you consider the way education is funded in the state, it seems like it would make sense if you're going to test to identify and you want to get the job done quickly, then it might make sense for the state to pay the cost of mitigation, which they, the state, are estimating won't be that great. Um, uh, so the bill logistically calls for testing, 50% of the mitigation, and then a rulemaking process that would make determinations about subsequent actions, like at what intervals you might test. So it wouldn't, under the Senate proposal, it's not a one-shot deal, it's test, mitigate, retest, and then at some point in the future test again. Um, we're really paying attention to what the costs are because I think it would be easy to get the cost wrong. The American Pediatric Society says no discernible amount of lead is a safe amount of lead for, um, for children. So there was a big push from the um, environmental community and the, and the public interest community to go to no detectable amount. The Senate compromised at three parts per billion. Um, 
which by definition will increase presumably the number of sources that are identified and the cost of mitigation. Um, I'm not a scientist. I don't know how to do the cost benefit analysis on it. I think that uh, given the, the interest in Vermont, I think that we're probably headed for a lower level and that seems appropriate when you consider health effects. It doesn't talk about um, what kids are drinking in their own homes. Um, and it also doesn't uh, reconcile an issue that I think is an issue it was identified in the Senate <coughs> Education Committee because given the um, testing protocols for water and municipal supplies in Vermont, there are some schools that are receiving water from the municipal system that are higher than three parts per billion. So the, there'll be questions about when that water enters the school, does the school have to mitigate it down to three parts per billion? Or is there some sharing associated with what the source is? Um, so those are all things that are yet to be determined. I think the House will have uh, interest in this because it is a compelling public policy issue with a real benefit that you need to delve into. And there are decisions that are going to need to be made about you know setting levels, who pays, and so on and so forth. Uh, our associations are pretty active in the conversation. Sometimes when we get active in the conversation, people construe us as be objecting. We're not objecting. We just want to have a program that first and foremost works well for kids, but also can be administered reasonably well, recognizes comparative risk analysis around cost benefits and so on and so forth. So we have the right program and one that perhaps is not too expensive. Um, the last thing I'll say on that is when all this starts up, school districts are going to have to be ready for what they may see and hear from the public because simply on the basis of this issue being introduced, I'm hearing from school superintendents who are saying our communities are becoming more activist around what's happening in our, in our schools. Um, so this will be a fascinating one. Uh, Jay, you're going to get a lot of experience in your first year on the uh, <laughs> education <laughs> body because you know it, there's a lot of useful learning that goes on around these subjects for everybody, including me. So that's that one. Would you like me to do H three? Sure. If okay. You're rolling. Yeah, absolutely. So as Representative Hooper said, uh, the House unanimously passed H three, which is the Ethnic Studies Bill. And I can tell you um, in a little uh, more detail what the bill uh, contains. Uh, it has an advisory working group, and that group has 18 members on it. Um, as passed by the House, the Senate Education Committee spent a lot of time on the bill last week and voted it out of their committee with a few changes. And one of the changes was they added two more people to the working group. Um, they added two student members to that group. So um, the, the duties of the group are to review standards for student performance that are adopted by the State Board of Education and recommend any updates or additional standards to the State Board um, so as to fully recognize the history, the contributions, and perspectives of ethnic groups and social groups. And um, ethnic groups and social groups are defined in the, um, in the bill. Um, there's a, in our legislative report that just came out on Saturday, a, um, full explanation of the bill with the definition of uh, ethnic groups and social groups. Um, the other thing that the working group can do if they have time is review Vermont statutes, state board rules, and school district policies um, that concern or impact these um, performance standards for students and they may um, make some recommendations to the State Board, um, and the State Board could recommend to the General Assembly proposed statutory changes um, that, to those, to the statutes or um, statutes affecting policies. Uh, another requirement in, in the bill is that the State Board of Education publish data on student performance and also on hazing, harassment, and bullying and it has to be um, disaggregated by student groups, and those student groups include ethnic, racial, and religious groups, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, poverty status, disability, disability status, and English language learner status. Um, so the next steps for the bill 
are uh, because it has uh, money to pay the people um, a per diem stipend um, that are on the um, working advisory group um, and is headed to the Senate Appropriations Committee this week. And uh, so we'll be continuing to follow it and um, see if there are any other changes that are made. Um, do you have any questions on the bill? I did. I was just wondering, was this, did this originate as a reaction to something that was going on in schools where they were finding a deficit in the kids or the community in our knowledge of ethnic and social it started, groups? Well, or? it started last year. It was, um, it was in the miscellaneous ed bill last year, which didn't end up getting passed. Um, so it had uh, quite a lot of momentum because it was uh, what was proposed, I believe, at the beginning of this year was pretty much what had been in the miscellaneous bed, bed bill last year. I'm just wondering whether, like, it was sort of coming out of an educational deficit, or, or like, what was sort of the origination of it? Do you know what the Yeah, so if you take a look at the, so if you went online and looked at age three, um, in the findings, the first finding makes reference to a 1999 report by the Advisory Committee to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. It was a Vermont Advisory Committee. And basically what they found in that uh, study was that um, schools were generally not adept at responding to principally incidents of um, racism that manifested themselves in the school. Then. There was a follow-up report in 2003 or 2004 which indicated that progress was being made but not sufficient progress. <laughs> then uh, the Attorney General in Vermont did a study of um, systemic manifestation of systemic racism and bias and identifying a bunch of, well, several institutions, one of which was schools. Um, and then, if you take a look at sort of the prominence of acts of bias, discrimination, hate, and so on and so forth that are manifesting themselves in the country over the last several years, and I won't offer any comment other than to say that we're all familiar with that, um, it seemed to make sense to do with schools what you always do with schools, and that is use them as the place to educate in an effort to respond to where you see deficiencies in society. So there's really aspects of it that go to what transpires in the school itself as well as how do you make uh, uh, children and, and, and students through the um, educational process more adept at fitting into society. So that's really the, okay. the background of it. It's a um, it is, a, you know, it's a, it's a very compelling issue and it, one that is difficult to tackle uh, because all of the manifestations of, uh, of um, people's belief, conduct, attitudes, etc., cetera, uh, don't really have a basis in the schools per se, but we look to the schools to address it and that's what H3 intends to do. Um, as Sue pointed out, it, it is intended to uh, examine the standards as a way to um, better inform educators uh, what they can do to address, you know, I'd say the full range of um, factors that contribute to not having folks, um, I would say, as uh, aware, sensitive, and responsive as they need to be. And I would add that if you're interested in, um, as a board, educating yourselves more on the topic, there's a um, very good um, film that the Vermont NEA um, arranged for. Um, they have a racial justice task force, which has a lot of different members that I um, serve on. And um, the film is called I Am From Here, and it's about Vermont schools. And some of you may have seen it at... Um, our conference in the fall, but it's available for um, you to be able to show at a board meeting if you want to do that. Great. Yeah, there was a, it's probably from the same studies that came out in 99 and, and early 2000, but there was a movement in a lot of the states where, you know, when I was in Massachusetts, they stepped in 
um, in the state uh, required you to collect data, especially discipline data, on the students, just like we're talking about here, so that they could differentiate to see if um, certain members of the diverse classes were actually being punished more or more mm -hmm. severely. Um, and they collected that data on an annual basis, and if things were, were out, of, out of line or out of whack, uh, we had to address it uh, as appropriately. But I spoke to this from the year. So it, it has been happening across the country. That was Massachusetts probably about eight years ago. That's going to be challenging. It will be. <clears throat> yeah, you guys got to get a data system that actually works. Not us guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, since you brought that up, there's a couple of other pieces of uh, news recently that you'll learn more about. Uh, Lane actually is uh, more well versed on the latter than, than I am, and maybe perhaps on the former too, but. Um, there was a provision in Act 11, which was the appropriations bill that was the subject of the veto last year that was passed in the, in the veto session that um, established uh, application and utilization of a uniform chart of accounts um, in schools, which is related to an interest in understanding um, the cost centers in public education. So there's going to be another story in Vermont Digger coming up about an appropriation request from the Department of Mental Health for $18 million for Success Beyond Six in order to support schools better in addressing mental health needs within the schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's just something that you should have on your radar. But as we talk about what schools do um, in terms of providing supports to children, folks who like to raise concerns about how much is spent in school, run up against folks who say, well, you're expanding the mission. Right. And one of the areas of mission expansion goes into what schools are doing to address the needs of children when they come to school. Um, and, you know, there's information that shows, data that shows the kids are more stressed than they have been in other years increasingly. Right. because of the manifestation of societal ills. So this chart of account issue was intended in part to get to that cost center question. Well, what the folks that I work with, Lane, business managers, and so on and so on, are, are finding out is that that system's not ready to go, despite the fact that the legislature said they wanted it in place by July 1, 2019. Um, so there's a there's a, there was a provision put in the Budget Adjustment Act to, um, to delay the utilization and application of that chart of accounts until July 1, 2020, but there's still concerns on the part of local school districts that overall the system's not going to be ready to go. So that, that would, that's going to be controversial because the local school officials are saying, you know, the system's not ready. They say that the AOE has not fulfilled its own duties and obligations, so there's a lot of controversy around that. I don't know how it's going to resolve. I'm still trying to understand better what exactly has transpired there. Um, so that's an issue. And then another issue, which is, I guess, tangentially related, Lane would know better than I do, is the fact that the state's longitudinal data system doesn't have the information it needs to determine um, uh, the distribution of title funds. So there was an article in Vermont Digger today about trying to do some uh, allocations on the basis of something other than the data that will have the folks that have higher need student populations wondering why they're not getting more money than they otherwise would. I don't, so that's, those are things that may or may not come into the, well they are going to come into the legislative session because it when Jay looked at his um, his schedule for the week, uh, what he saw was that the AOE's coming in to talk about the work that they've done on student counts and data overall and so on. One of the, uh, I'll, I'll make my comment here, um, AOE's got to get its act together. Um, they're not functioning to provide us with the regular services that they should. And now they're being tasked with doing all this extra work. The financial system is, is one big piece of it. 
there were two towns, is my understanding, um, that kind of modeled the system. We're trying to get, get everything up and ready to go to, to, to go through all the steps so that other people could learn from it. They've been at it for quite a while now, and they're not up and ready to go. Uh, and so and there's been mandates on when stuff needs to be done. I've got faculty um, in my finance um, department, three of them, uh, that are spending two to eight hours a week doing so webinars. And then another 12 to 15 hours of homework a week uh, to learn about a system that's not even up and operational. So <clears throat> there are some issues there. And again, I know there's a lot of transition, but they got to get their regular house cleaning stuff up and running first. Title funding, we weren't able to get our title funding until November, um, despite the fact that everything was in on time. Um, it sat there, and it sat there, and we would call and try to get it moved through the list. And you know, we can't serve kids without the money. Um, it put us in a really bad space. So it'd be nice to see them get those things straightened out, mm -hmm. and then you know, make sure stuff is up and running before they expect folks to use it. But the longitudinal data system is a whole other one. The reason it came up was because if they're going to collect assessment data um, in terms of how well these standards are being implemented in the schools, they have no way of doing it um, because the system doesn't work. It just doesn't communicate well with all the various different information systems the schools have. So just another another concern. But they, I, I always call it consolidating the gains. They move forward in some good things, uh, but they got to consolidate the gains, get them up and running. Well. Mm -hmm. Pretty much it yeah. from us. The um, the Senate Bill Nine, that was the one requiring us to check on. Um, do background checks on folks in homeschool? Yeah, that, that's that been set aside. Okay. But that's, I, you know, I, I'm not sure whether it's been tabled permanently, but it's been set aside, and uh, it should be set aside because homeschoolers have a direct connection mm -hmm. with the AOE, and the AOE licensed new educators. So if the state, as a matter of policy, wanted to run background checks on um, homeschool providers, there's no reason to take the local school district central office and insert them in the middle of that process. That's that's like adding steps when you don't need that step. Yeah, I was trying to figure out, since we're not monitoring, except for the letter that we get from the AOE once a month, you know, who we should be checking on and how we should be checking on them to make sure they're in compliance with providing right. us with the info. Right. So that one, I'm not sure what happened to that. There was also a bill that was being taken up um, on dual enrollment eligibility for students in religious schools, but there's a federal court case on that that's been leveled against the state of Vermont, so the General Assembly is likely not to act on that also while they wait to see what the, what the outcome of that court case is. And then the House 27, uh, which was a smoking gauge? Yeah, so that's an issue that uh, I haven't paid attention to since I pulled superintendents on it. There was a bill that would increase the age of procurement um, of tobacco and tobacco related products from 18 to 21 and uh, there's a coalition um, uh, tobacco 21 coalition which is largely comprised of the um, American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association and they paid a visit to two Prospect Street where our organizations along with the Principals Association are headquartered and they asked if we were inclined to support that. Um, each of our associations, I think, has a somewhat different disposition on it. The superintendents who have polled were largely in support of that because um, they see it as helpful in an era where utilization of nicotine-related products is actually becoming harder to manage in schools because of vapor, vape, vaping and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So, but that, that issue um, of increasing the age from 18 to 21 is, it's not a simple issue for some people because of other rights of citizenship that come with being 18 rather than 21. So, I, I, I don't know what the status of that is. I think that it's likely that it's going to get some attention. Um, there's also a tobacco tax that was added in an effort to address that. That seems to have more momentum than the age to age 21. But I'm not, I haven't, just, we usually, we keep it, we pay attention to those issues, but that was one that was sort of ancillary, particularly given the time that we uh, were forced to spend on age 39 over the last two weeks. 
we did pass an increase in um, the the tax on um, vapes and the, the stuff. So that was passed quickly through the house. That's Zoe's. Yeah, the um, I don't know what you want to do. <laughs> Um, and not only that, anything that the students can liquefy, they can bake. Um, and we had a student that OD here um, not too long ago using the baking product. So it's uh, you know anything that, that folks can do to help support, um, at least in the schools, if not statewide, uh, would be helpful. Um, one of the neat things that I saw, and of course I'm sure some of the principals and superintendents may not agree, was um, in some of the states they actually that had some pretty strict um, tobacco laws and paraphernalia laws um, swore in the principals and the superintendents as magistrates. So if a kid violated the smoking or those tobacco policies, or in this case it would be the vaping policies within the school, um, they would meet with the magistrate um, and they would assign them a state fine right down there. Um, and the state and the school would split the fine and the money would be used for anti um, drug and anti-smoking legislation. So just some ideas to throw out. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you have anything to add? A bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm on finance committee and we deal with money issues. Um, last year, the funding system was changed. There's no longer a general fund transfer. More money has been put into the Ed Fund from the sales tax revenues than it used to be. And this is the new regime going forward. Administration's been in twice. One was on a, um, a bill that would collect sales taxes from mail orders and other things. And they, are, they started right out by saying they were going to divert it was a sales tax bill, but it wasn't going to go into the Ed Fund. So the games are going to, will continue. The, the administration um, is likely to try and not have to fund the Ed Fund. So that pressure will be there. Um, last year, uh, we had a rookie governor, uh, rookie leader of the Senate, rookie leader of the House. We ran into June, as everybody knows. And I felt that you know, we got out of town without burning the place down, and, and that was good for having three rookies to start the last session. This year, um, I think I read there was a charm offensive in, uh, in, in Digger, but uh, I think Jason Gibbs has been sentenced to uh, eating lunch in the cafeteria with legislators, <laughs> and uh, the governor himself has come in for breakfast, and there seems to be a lot more communication. Um, the Ed Fund... Funding is supposed to be about the same. Um, the tax, tax rate's about the same, which is good news. Um, one bizarre thing I got when I was campaigning last year, I heard a lot about um, hardening the schools and protecting them from gun violence. And I sat down with a piece of paper and I tried to remember how many doors there were in this building. <laughs> and um, I counted garage doors and double doors and single doors Double doors is one, and I came up with 29, and when I drove in tonight, I forgot the, the garage door over here. <laughs> <laughs> I still have to find out where my memory is. Um, and the Senate had a class, the 30 of us, um, and we did it during lunch um, last week, um, in by, uh, implied bias training. And, and I was shocked at what we learned about ourselves. And we're supposed to be you know, sophisticated people and not carry any prejudices around with us. And it was, um, yeah, I was, it was, uh, for me, it was, uh, it was uh, one of those things, wow, I thought I was uh, better than I apparently am. And, uh, so that, I, th I think it's a worthwhile thing and all folks of my generation are yours. <laughs> consider um, and um, that sort of I can answer any questions and I, I wanted to say my, the worst thing that's happened to me since the legislature started was a phone call Saturday to say that uh, 
my friend and, and um, Edie Benson and I and Dean Meltzer and were an eighth grade team for 20 some years to, yeah. that he had died on Saturday morning mm. after not having been retired for two years. Yeah, that was sad news. That was very sad news. My excuse for mentioning it was that when Dean first came here in, in the late 70s, he embarked upon an ambitious plan to cut down on energy use in this building. And everybody said, who is this guy? <laughs> and when you look at the high school, you see that, that where the windows used to be, and one's, you see one window was covered and the, the other window is still open. And he did a lot of stuff with renewable energy in the buildings in the early 80s. And uh, I think we kind of... People haven't been around a long time, but I forgot that this building and it's the way it operated changed from mm. eighth grade science teacher his first couple of years here, in addition to mm. his teaching. So. Does anyone else have something to add? The only thing I would add, um, well, it's been good to have Jay on education. Um, I'm on healthcare, so it's uh, good to have somebody in this arena um, this session. Um, just one thing that I would add that I think is important going forward is, um, as Jeff said, it, it does seem to be a shift away from the ed um, financing conversation that we've seen for the last couple of years onto larger um, other issues. We saw it with the Act 46, and I think as seen by the Act 46, it becomes a lot more political process. Um, the political parties have a harder time um, structuring it in a way that um, they like, that's a little bit more predictable. So as we saw with Act 46, things can fly through, unlikely coalitions can form, and it is a little bit more of a viable time um, when it's not talking about the dollars and cents, but larger issues that impact communities differently regardless of politics. So that's my two cents. Yeah, it was really a free-for-all, actually. It was actually the democratic process took place. Thank you. Thanks so much for Thank coming. For coming. We really appreciate it. Enjoy well, coming down here. Right did here. you have a question or, or comment? Sure. Can we ask before oh, they... Of course, yeah. yes. I have a couple of short questions. On the e-cigarette issue, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's more education or health. I like the ideas of the tax that already just passed, maybe raising the age. I like Lane's idea. Is there anything against just doing a ban on flavor? It seems like a very blatant marketing to youth. That just seems silly. And why can't we just ban Other than the maple syrup producers? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know there's efforts that on the federal level that have started to ban some of the flavoring of it. I know that there's are a couple other bills, I'm not an expert on this, um, there's a couple other bills that would limit the distribution of it and um, some more targeted measures to That'd be good flavor, right? Um, so I know there's discussion. And another question is, this school has experienced some disruptions from threats made by students over the past three to five years. And Lane had brought up an idea of something he had seen in Massachusetts where sometimes a bill is passed with a little more teeth for the penalties to kind of, um, to kind of discourage future copycat events. And I didn't know if your colleagues in other towns in Vermont are experiencing the same thing and whether there's been any discussion for a bill similar. Yeah. Um, obviously, in the Vermont legislature creating a new crime with a whole host of complications that need to be carefully considered. I did, I met with Maine, Lane this fall um, about that same issue. Um, and I've started to discuss with a couple of other colleagues um, who have um, dealt with these situations as well about um, a larger conversation about how uh, we treat these situations, whether through the legal system or otherwise. This is a good one. Yeah. I, I have a question about just, because when I talk with students sometimes, mm -hmm. they're talking about that kids are getting this stuff sometimes through eBay. And I find that hard to believe. Like, is there no regulation on, can you just like get stuff on eBay Think that's you can just re regardless of age? Yeah, I'm not an expert. I, I don't, so, I was surprised. Matt, I'm sure knows more about it than I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but I, I thought, I think that the bill, 
I believe that the bill that we talked about that would uh, increase the age of procurement to 21 also has that ban on an online acquisition period. Um, yeah. Because it, I mean, you're absolutely right. If you, if you, I mean, we've heard, not this school, we've heard of uh, pyramid schemes in schools where there's actually distribution um, systems, you know, right down through the grades and so on and so forth. Right. You, can't, you know, uh, so it's a, it is a, I, I'm, I'm glad for multiple reasons that there's a focus on it right now, and I hope that we, uh, the state addresses it in a way that actually curbs some of the conduct that you're talking about. I believe the measure to limit distribution on the online channels is a, a separate um, measure than the 21. It's I think it's H26 and 20. Move it to 21 is H27. So there are two different. But I think okay. people are now cognizant. The average age in the legislature is over 60 still. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it takes a little time to think through some of these trends that you know this wasn't happening when I was here in Randolph. Um, right. So I think the ball is rolling now in some of those efforts, um, and people are recognizing the challenge it is. You should be proud of your delegation. Um, you know, they, they, uh, Ben and Jay are making a name for themselves in terms of the contributions they make. Mark established his name a long time ago. He continues to enjoy that. But I, I like to come down just for this kind of an interaction because this is representative form of government and you've got people who are willing to, you know, I mean, I, I don't need to tell you, you know, but it's, it's a pleasure to work with all three of them. We're smart voters. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Okay, we really you. appreciate it. Jeez, Jeff, thanks for being so forgiving. You didn't like my votes in committee. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then, by the way, the Agency of Education acknowledges that this act is not together, and they think that with the longitudinal data system, after they sort out the turbulence yeah. of this year, and we're out of the If any of you want to get some more, if any of you want some more, yeah. Yeah. coffee should be done if anybody wants coffee. It's over there. Would you like anything? I'm <laughs> I hear you are fairly injured. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. I don't think they should ban the flavors. I think they should make them universally revolting. <laughs> Some of the Harry Potter flavors. Like, yeah. like dog manure or, you know. <laughs> you have to really want it. <laughs> I know. But you can buy a prepaid at the store with... You might be able to use a debit You can buy a prepaid credit card at, the sh at Shaw's. You can get a debt, and you can get a debit. You can yeah. Use debit card. Mm -hmm. Sorry. All right. <laughs> Sorry. I feel like I missed something important. Credit cards are easy to get. Okay. And they don't even have to be connected to a name. Keith, do you want a chair to put your exactly. mic on? Exactly. Uh, no, I'm okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We have public, and and our next. Um, after the, the meeting with the legislature, the first thing we have is community engagement. So I know, or I think, that perhaps we have um, some people who would like to say something. Can you go first? Yeah. Well, um, I just want to bring my opinion to the table, we'll have the board look at something. Mm -hmm. I feel that with the high school raising the Black Lives Matter flag, that the superintendent is in violation of policy 2.0 because I don't believe it is a commonly accepted educational practice to have a political and controversial display as that is on a public high school. And I'd like the board to look at it and remember that it is, it is funded by taxpayers and I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think it's ethically good to have uh, taxpayer money making a political statement without an actual vote. And if the board would please know, look into it and uh, have an opinion on it at least. Well, we, we will discuss that as, as, as regards to policy 2.0. And the next meeting in March, um, the, some students um, are going to come and present to us the first part of the March meeting about the Black Lives Matter issue and 
and from their perspective and so we'll see what that entails. I'm not sure exactly what they're going to bring, but we've allotted them 20 minutes. They requested and I know some that, time I know next from the meeting. meeting that was here a week ago. I know you and Ann were both here. That if that was a cross section of the communities, there's you know greatly divided opinions on it, mm -hmm. and there was quite a few voices that think it's a political statement, and you know just with the climate and politics today I think the district should strive to be politically neutral and and not make a statement on one side or the other and if there's any question I would think neutrality is is where you want to end up and not in controversy thank you we second that um, also it was it was mentioned that the superintendent made comment to a school board member that this was Elijah's school, and he can do what he wants. I want to tell the superintendent, it is not Elijah's school. It is not your school. It is Braintree, Brookfield, and Randolph, taxpayers and parents. This is our school. We pay your salaries. So we think that uh, we agree with Brian. This is a, this is a problem. And um, you know, if Elijah would like to push his political or social agenda, he should look into maybe a private school somewhere, not a public school. So, I um, we feel that we sh that should be looked into along with Brian. Okay, thanks. Did you have uh, something to add? Yeah, just to build on it, 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 it's not just the Black Lives Matter this this immediate incident that concerns me about the political statement that's being made out of this school. It goes back to the beginning of the season where the very first assembly yeah. was presented to the student, entire student body, and that's including a number of new students that just transitioned into this school from their schools closing down. And the very first message that was entailed and spread on is that if you agree with the mascot in the school, then <clears throat> it's a racist symbol. So it's been an agenda since the very beginning of the school. And so it, it's, it's, to say it's not a political statement is completely turning around and running away from the fact that it really is. Because it's something that's being driven. It's being driven since, since last year when the student body tried to have this get passed and approved. But what they needed to do is they needed to have more evidence-based scenarios in order for the administration to say, we'll jump on the bandwagon with you. <clears throat> If you talk to other students in this school, and I coach here, so I've had numerous conversations with students that are against this whole movement. <clears throat> and it, coming out of that PBL, the Racial Justice PBL, students say that the students in that PBL are the ones that were running around the school putting up the homophobic slurs, the racial slurs that moved to have the administration back them on this Black Lives Matter flag. So my concern is, is with a scenario that I had with another student reading an essay that they wrote for their college applications <laughs> and hearing the message that he was trying to send, but then questioning him on it and having them state to me that it was a lie in the essay. So my concern is, is this, this PBL teaching our students to create scenarios based on lies to ensue a response that allows them to get what they want. And it's a movement that needs to be looked at seriously. Because <clears throat> when they state things publicly to the parents, they state things falsely in the number of people that support that idea. If you go on the website today and you read about one student that posted an essay about the March for Lives movement, it said the majority of the student body supported the movement when they all left class during the day. It was a very small percentage of students that actually supported that movement that went out to list, hear the names read. Numbers as low as below 30 from what I heard. That's a very small populace. It's not the majority of the student body. So when messages are being presented to the parents and to the public on issues that are being brought up in this school, they're being misconstrued with the amount of support that they actually have on those issues. And I think that's a disjustice to anybody that's trying to learn by going to the website to get that information. So I think we also need to, is if they're going to have these movements and if they're going to have these issues, <clears throat> they better truthfully and honestly state the facts about the issues and the facts about the amount of support that they have for these issues. And that's just 
an addition to what they had on that move. Thank you. One other comment I'd like to just make, I know, again, at that same meeting, which I think the rest of the board should really hear, is there were two students here that made the comment that they were they're raised in a conservative household, and they felt that the administration, the teachers, and some of the students looked down upon them for having a conservative values. And that is just, I mean, that's atrocious to even think that the school and the teachers would have that type of reaction to these students. And if that's the way they feel, you know, it's, it's, it's alarming to have students actually state, state that out loud. One more thing. Did anybody see the t-shirts that they made? <clears throat> no. No. Did anybody see what they did at the end of the assembly in the school? Yeah, they raised their fists. It was in the paper. Yeah, so the uh, the message on the t-shirt, and I said that I didn't stand behind that t-shirt, because the closed fist symbol is a symbol to incite the very thing that they say that they're against. That's what it means. That's what it means. Shook your head, no, but that's exactly what it means. <clears throat> the message, respect existence or expect resistance, is a message that says, we will act out if you don't agree with us. What he just made the statement of is with students that haven't agreed with their message when they went into classrooms to present, and they said that they gave a presentation to the entire student body. They only presented to the seventh grade and the tenth grade classes, not the entire student body. When students talked back against them, the very students in the PVL did bully and harass students to, because they didn't agree with their message. I just sat up in the gymnasium and I watched a kid from an opposing team who had an incident involved in this school. And when something happened in the game, I watched everybody who was wearing those t-shirts and representing jump up and jeer at the kid as he was down on the floor. Something that we shouldn't be promoting in this school and we shouldn't promote anywhere. It's a message that we send to everybody that comes into our school and then comes into our community about who and what we are. We're a unified district in this school, and there's anything but unity in this school right now. And that's students, that's faculty, administration. It's a broken system right now. And it doesn't flow, and it doesn't function. And it doesn't function in the benefit of the kids. And it needs to be fixed. And there's a majority of people in this community, and there's more people. And the, the problem I have with the most is that there'd be more people here today if they didn't feel like if they were here to speak up against some stuff, that their kids wouldn't have retribution put down on them in the school. And that's a problem there too, if people feel that way. And something that needs to be looked at and it needs to be discussed. And right. the last thing I'm going to say before I go back to the basketball game is that um, with, along with what Jason just said is there's faculty in this school that said the principal of T. Elijah Hawks took great uh, pride in creating controversy and was happy that this was going on because of this happening at the school, them raising the flag. If they wanted to have a PBL and discuss something like that, that's what they should have done is left it at the discussion, not fostered them putting this on the whole school in that assembly and putting their fist in the air like, here, gotcha. Not acceptable. I'm done. Well, thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate them, and we'll, you know, cont we'll be open-minded and discuss and think about, you know, take into consideration all that you have said. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Next, um, well, we have a budget informational meeting on Wednesday, February 27th, which will be right here in the RUHS Media Center. Um, I know it is late before the budget vote, but um, that is mandated. It has to be within a certain number of business days before the vote, and so um, that is when it is, Ten. February 27th. Mm -hmm. um, Next, board maintenance management, I'm sorry, board management and governance. Um, and we've got uh, negotiation with unions. 
Is yeah. that something you want to talk about? Hand out kind of strategies. So there's the, the CBA. Um, you see that in the, the top. Um, that is the teachers' union, negotiations with the teachers' union. That's the collective bargaining agreement. Um, the other chart here, it's got the pretty little table on it. It's for the negotiations that are ongoing right now with some of the staff. Um, these are strategy sheets. Um, so in other words, I've gone through, taken a look at what the unions are asking for, gone back, done the data inspection and the data checking. Um, and then I pulled that together a strategy for the board to consider and recommendations for the board to consider as, as we kind of approach that. Um, you can start on either side that you want. Um, <coughs> Um, that's not one that probably should be in. No, uh, yeah, no, that's not. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> not, that, not that it can't be open, but it should, some of it's our strategy. Sorry. So. Yeah, no. Sorry. No, no, no. So do we want to do this Wait, in which, public session? Uh, there's things we can talk uh, yeah, about. Yeah, I need that back. Okay. <laughs> so both. Yeah. So you don't want to do that. So I think the, the biggest thing right now in terms of the, the support staff is that um, no. the negotiations group, I think, recognizes, and, and it's clear in the comparables when you check with the other districts and what's going on, um, that in most cases they are significantly behind. Uh, and in some cases by 10 to 13 percent um, what they could be making in the other districts. And so the strategy that was pulled together was an attempt to actually rise them up, not only from comparable, but from a little bit ahead. Um, one of the problems that ensued at the, uh, the last meeting was they were unwilling to negotiate on, on what they wanted for salary. Uh, we came back with two different offers. Um, they refused to even consider. Uh, so we've got to see how that goes in the future. Unfortunately, what will most likely happen um, is if they are not willing to move and work with us to reach an agreement, is it will go to arbitration and they will get significantly less than even we offered. And we offered quite a bit. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping um, that they're in a little bit better, better move next time. They can so they're asking for more than? They're asking for 10% across the board. Um, which isn't unreasonable. Uh, we started out at 4.5, went up to 4.75. Um, and again, that number could go up significantly depending upon what other language changes that they're looking for and are going to hold, hold to just because of the expense that those may have. Um, so I do have my, my recommendations down there for folks to kind of look at before we move So I think that's, that's the biggest um, kind of sticking point with them. Um, the concerns that I have a little bit, um, and it's kind of worded in here, um, over the course of time, uh, the paraprofessional um, members of the support staff, uh, their salaries have grown quite a bit, um, whereas the custodians, uh, the cooks, and the secretary, um, those salaries have not kept pace. Um, they're actually falling far behind what the other groups in there um, that are part of the support staff have. And I think the reason for that is, is because they're not really represented in the paper. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the reasons that I put this in a grid um, for the uh, hopefully the next offer, if the, the negotiations team approves it, is so that we can address that. Um, you know, it's one thing to say, hey, you get 6% and they divvy it up the way they want in the grid. That's not going to help us out because we cannot hire cooks and we cannot hire custodians. Just some thoughts and some pieces. We can answer any questions. But that's that's the big piece right now. The other thought on it too is that they, they are pretty consistent in terms of the language changes outside of salaries um, as the teachers. And so it's kind of nice to kind of work through. Um, and we're trying to get through this year jumping the salary up as much as we can for them. Um, and worry about the language changes that they're requesting next year. We have to go back to the negotiating table in one year anyway, um, just to see what the teachers come up with and try to get everything to match. So any questions on support staff? Um, in terms of the CBA, in terms of the teacher's contract, 
Um, they asked for a pretty hefty increase as well. Um, support staff were asking for a 10% increase across the board. The uh, teachers were asking for an 8% increase. Um, I am going to read through a little bit here, um, just so folks know where they currently stand relative to the other districts out there, because I think it's important for, for everyone around the table to know as well as, as the public. Um, to kind of see how we compare, uh, I looked at 11 other districts in our area, including at least four that are out of our league in terms of size and tax base, like Stowe, Champlain Valley Supervisory Union, Orange North Coast. Um, we had Cabot in there, we had Barry, we had Twinfield, we had U32, which is another big one, Craftsbury, Harwoods, um, Montpelier, and then we did get uh, a version of the new contract from White River Valley Supervisory Union. Um, what I looked at was I looked at nine salary points. I looked at steps one, seven, and five. So in other words, if you're a first-year teacher, um, uh, seven-year teacher, or excuse me, or in your 15th year, which is where our salary scale ends, and I looked at those three points in the bachelor's, the master's, and the master's plus 30 states. The average of the 11 districts at each of these salary points was compared with us. And in all cases, we were above the average by at least 2.5%, and in some cases by as much as 7.6%. In um, all cases? In all cases. Even the big, like Champlain? Wow. At all three education levels, and this is a little bit concerning, the highest step in terms of years of service was also the highest above the comparables average. Um, mm. In each case, at all three education levels, the lowest step in terms of years of service was the lowest above the comparables average. Mm. Now, this is important in terms of considering because lots of times what you'll have is the union representation is typically the senior members, and mm -hmm. so they make sure that the higher end of the pay scale gets the biggest increases. But what ends up happening is you lose out in being able to attract new employees because those salaries haven't kept, kept, kept pace, and that's kind of looks like what's been happening here over time. Um, so in terms of negotiating with them and working with them, I think part of the strategy is to make sure that a big chunk of the money is going to the lower rungs on the, um, on the contract and the pay scale. Um, other districts uh, looked at, um, out of all the other districts that we looked at, we offered the best benefits package. There was only one district that came even close out of that, le that 11. Um, in terms of leave, and that's looking at sick, emergency, and personal leave, our employees receive 10 more days per year than the average of the other districts. Based on the average uh, salary of the teachers in our district, these additional 10 days have a monetary value of $3,224 per teacher. And one of the concerns and one of the discussions and where we're at um, is uh, those days because on average um, our teachers are missing 18 days of school a year. So if you've got 179 days with the kids or 100 and, and, uh, and you're missing 18 days on average, it's wow. a lot of learning. That's a lot. Lot. And you said that was above others. Yeah. Now, interestingly, in addition to those 10 days above and beyond each year that they get, um, it's actually written into the contract that the first two snow days that we have, they do not have to make up what they get paid for. In most districts, what happens if you have a snow day because the teachers are contracted for 185 days or whatever it may be, if you have a snow day, you come back and you add that day on to the end of the year. And you work on. So they've got a significant amount of time that's lost. And it has a direct impact, or at least it seems to, when you look at the data in terms of the performance of our students. Um, I broke down, on average, how many uh, teacher days are lost each year at each of the schools. I think we kind of looked at that a little while ago. Obviously, um, time with the teacher is important. So the schools that have the highest number of teacher averages are the lowest performing. Highest number of teacher absences. Uh, the lowest wow. So it's, it's a little bit of a concern. Mm -hmm. On average, the other 11 districts pay 82% of the teacher's health insurance. We pay 85%. We also pay the teacher's long-term disability, dental insurance, and life insurance. Um, most districts don't offer all three. In the cases where they do, they usually don't pay for the totality of all three. Um, and then our course reimbursement benefit is also one of the more robust out there. Overall class size, we can look at the high school. Um, class sizes are larger there at the elementary school. Overall class size on average at the high school is 12.6 students. That's not including the special education classes, meaning that most teachers have a student load between 50 and 63 students in this high school. 
that's half of the national average. It's half of the highest performing schools in Massachusetts, which are also the highest performing schools in the nation. The overall class size for high school special education teachers is 2.8, and a total student load of 17. Math and ELA teachers at the high school generally teach four classes. Five to six classes is the standard. But what they do with that fifth class is they run a structured study hall instead. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is there was a lot of data that was not right um, in terms of claims that teachers are overworked, you know, they're, they can go off to other districts and have a much easier time. They've got the best of the best here, um, not just in compensations, but in terms of their, 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 their workload. Um, they also had mentioned turnover. Um, I took a look. Um, the average time and position of our faculty is 11 years at the high school, 10 years at the elementary level, 10 years in special education, and 12 years at RTCC. Um, and that's given that we have a 15-step pay scale, so we have a very veteran staff. Um, on average, teachers have been here about 11 years. Things that the, so in terms of the salary piece, um, we didn't talk about it. Um, I don't think there's going to be agreement on it. Um, our initial offer was 2.5%. Um, their initial request was 8%. Um, but again, they wanted to be able to divvy up that 8%, giving some steps on the pay scale more than others. Um, in some cases, I think the one-year salary jump, the way they were giving it up for some of the folks, would be about $6,000. And in other cases, on the lower end, would be about $4,000. So just to put things in, in perspective. I love the teachers, don't get me wrong, um, at all. Um, I think they do a fabulous job. I'd give them, I'd give them six figures a year if, if, if we could, and people were, were agreeable to it. And that's what I would recommend. But... Uh, I think there's a disconnect between how good they really have it and what they believe that they have. And I think it's because a lot of them have been here for a while and don't have anything to compare it to. That's one thing if you're coming in from another district. Um, the thing that we did talk about um, in principle um, was sick bank. Um, and the suggestion was, is uh, in terms of the sick bank, is okay. If you want to give up 10 of those leave days a year, maybe we'll consider a sick bank. Um, and that's kind of where the, the discussions have been. Okay. Uh, but a lot of that is the focus on getting the, the teachers in the classroom more often and making sure they're in the as much as possible while still, you know, if they gave up 10 days, they'd still have 18 days of leave they could take every year uh, between sick and personal. Which is what most schools have. Which is, which is what the higher uh, schools have. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we're never going to get those benefits back. You know, the union, we'll just never get them back. Yeah. So those are kind of where, the, where things are in the state. But again, in this the conversation that I'm having is not, not meant to be derogatory whatsoever. These teachers do a darn good job. But they have it's one of the top benefits packages around, uh, as well as they've got a pretty good working conditions um, in terms of class load. Um, they do, like a lot of the folks in the state, you know, they are a bit stressed dealing with the trauma-based mm -hmm. issues with the students, and we're all, all feeling that. But part of the budget uh, work that's been going on this year so far is to hopefully get programs in place that are going to settle that down, at least here, um, in the coming years to make their, their work life a bit better. I don't know if there's questions or... And again, that process, um, especially for those that are new, is the negotiations team works with the uh, works with the union. Um, anything that they come up with as potential agreements, nothing is is a done deal until this board, this whole board votes on it um, and decides as a board that that's what they want to do. Um, the same thing is true with the teachers union. Um, they have to take whatever potential agreements are there, go back to their membership, and then their membership has to vote on it um, as a body. Just because we're negotiating, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. well, we have two more negotiations before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the next ones are at the end of this month, or are they in March? Next week. 
221 for the CBA for the teachers for next week and the 19th next week for the support staff. Okay. And those are open. Anybody is welcome to come and see the negotiations. They're at Randolph Elementary School. Um, both start at 5 p.m. Uh, they're in the media center there. I just have a quick question. I don't know if it's legal to sort of like ask people, like, why are you absent so often? But I just, I mean, it sounds like you're sort of assessing that some of that may be just stress. I mean, you know which schools yeah, where the absenteeism, or, I shouldn't say it's absenteeism, but you know, that they have young children and having to take time because their kid is sick, or is it? Is there something going on? Are you looking at, at I just wonder if it's, that's it's, data that you look at to also try and figure out, is there a climate issue? Is there, you know, what's going on that maybe teachers are not we did the, we did doing the well? We did the climate survey, which was fairly positive. Um, we did right. the data a few, few months back. Right, right. Um, I think it's just, again, not in every case, so I don't want to say that this is true, but I think in general um, there's a lot of absenteeism going on. Um, and I think when you got 28 days to look at, it makes it easier to make the decision that, hey. Um, I'm going to take a mental health and, day and, or and teaching, by, yeah. by the same token, teaching is, a, is, is it's, it's tough, it's rigorous, it's not right. like um, a lot of private jobs where, you know, when I worked in private industry, um, you'd work your tail off for three months on a project, you get a month or two of downtime until the next project came. Your teaching is bang, 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 you're planning, you're delivering, you're assessing, you're planning, right. and it, it never stops for the whole 185 days. So yeah, you get tired. So there should be a, a reasonable amount of absenteeism that goes along with it. Right. What's reasonable? My experience, seven to nine days. Right. You know, unless you got something big else that's going on. So you're looking at that as the management group to sort of assess what's going on with my employees that that they're taking so many, so much time and is there That's things the that you can do to help reason help for suggesting that the, the change um, is to try to yeah this still gives you the opportunity if you've got that, uh, that sick bank you know if you give up those ten days and if you really need it it's there for you okay. um, as opposed to just being available because we don't really. You know, if a person says they're out sick, you know, unless we see a right. pattern there, hey, you know, you're out every Friday after a Bruins game, or you're, right. you know, those, those are patterns you can actually see sometimes. But right. you know, unless unless that's going on, mm -hmm. it's not our call. I mean, it's their time. It's my call. Right, right, yeah, right. You know, right. Like, that's why most of those days are actually personal days, right? They're they're not even sick days. Yeah, so they're not. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not in a position why. to even approve them. They yeah. just they they they've got right. them. Right. Right. Person, so they can do whatever they want. They right. don't want to be in a position to have to approve them. No. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and there, I'm sure there's probably some legalities there, but yeah. I well, just I think I, I mean, I, I heard you asking something different than I think Lane answered. Is there another? Is is is, is, there, is it a climate issue within the school that is making, you know, lending towards people not wanting to be at work or choosing, you know not to be at work. There's no doubt that that could contribute. Um, I'm happy to kind of research it, but like I said, we did do the climate survey a few months right. back, and those results were not bad at all. Yeah. Um, divided by school? I mean, could you, could you separate the Braintree School from the Brookfield School? From the that's you know, a good question. I mean, yeah. The data is still sitting in there. I was told I was told at a parent teacher conference at the Braintree School that the staff all gets along really well, and they really like each other, and it's a very, it's a very collegial atmosphere, and that's the school with the lowest one of the comments that you'll get. Uh, right, so you wonder whether that leads to there, less so. absenteeism. Right. One of the comments that you'll get is that the teachers do feel it's a very family-like atmosphere in the district. Mm -hmm. um, the whole district. Yeah, because they take care, of, take care of each other. The administration takes care of them. Um, so, but I can find out. I'll see if that data can be segregated. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to look at it, break no, it down by elementary and high school as well. It doesn't hurt to know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's concerning if our teachers are absent more than usual, twice usual twice. teachers, yeah, right? Twice twice. Right. Twice right. as much. And that's, you know, that yeah. definitely should, but you know, you would hope it leads to twice as much leave. decline in learning. Part of that is they, the, the benefit is twice as much. Right. And so, I mean, the, some of these teachers are just taking care of a benefit. I mean, if taking you're advantage out, of a benefit, advantage. If you're allowed to miss 10 days. Why would you not miss 10 days? It's a vacation day. 
And so some of them plan it out probably every two weeks I take a vacation day or, or something. I mean, it could be anything. It may not have anything to do with the school district performance in the sense that they're not feeling like I want to be here. It could right. just be, I had this benefit, why would I not use it? Mm -hmm. Right, well that's why I was asking, can you even ask that? Because right. I don't, I don't think know can. if you can even yeah. ask that. When I, when I say when I say 18 on average, that that doesn't mean that every teacher's taking 18. It means some that are taking a whole heck of a lot more. Taking all point so, seven some, some, Yeah, some are, some are, you know, much lower than that. But if it, it averages it out, out of a staff of um, 109 full-time teachers, about 2,000 days a year. <laughs> that's an awful lot. It's, that's costly for our kids. Well, you know, like I said, it, there's a, there is a, there's clear data that shows that there's a pretty direct impact on their learning. Yeah. Well, and are you sure on that? Because, you know, that's, that, is that really causal? Do we know? I mean. Pretty good data. And the research, the research will tell you that the, the, the most important thing in terms of learning for kids is, is time, time with the teacher, teacher, right? That is qualified, true. Highly qualified so. teacher. Mm -hmm. So the, that would, you know, you can't right, prove anything right. 100%. You know, right, there are actually right, some right. philosophers will say there's nothing that's causal, but um, it's a pretty good indication, and it, it kind of mimics what the research tells you. Right, right. And if we're seeing that in, in the district, yeah. Just, it's kind of interesting. So some of that, that, that give and take is, is, is an attempt. They, they really believe in the sick bank, and there are times when it would be really good for, for teachers. <coughs> if you've got somebody at home that's incredibly ill, then you need that caretaker. You need the caretaker, plus just the, the fact to spend time with somebody who may not be around for you. Um, but so, you know, that, that's available. That's something that they, they may not have otherwise. Well, and we do, we do have a number of younger teachers, at least at, I don't know, in the elementary schools, if we've had a number with small children. But if, sure. you know, you can't, you can't take your child to work with you when they're throwing up everywhere. So mm -hmm. that's the other piece. I think we need to be careful that we're making sure we're being, understanding why people are without breaking any any laws. I <laughs> can't speak right for to do what they anyone but myself that I have never turned down a request except for once and that was because there was a Okay. Let's move on to EL monitoring. We have um, three reports this month. Um, you want to walk us through them? So this is the first presentation, correct? For 2.3. Yes. And 2.8 was is an update. We, we were given his report in August, and we asked that he um, give us an update because there were certain things not in compliance and it was there was some controversy around it so I would think that these are all first reads and the next month we will approve them yeah. okay. I can I can point out if it's worth with kind of there were a couple of like little highlights um, 2.3 um, is really kind of focused on ensuring that you know we're using proper procedures um, to protect the, the, the monies that are entrusted to the district by the town and while making sure that we remain liquid, that we can still, you know, are using the money where it should be, we're not running out uh, and uh, unable to meet the, the, the board's ends because of that. Um, most of the evidence uh, in terms of compliance uh, with uh, EL 2.3 comes from your yearly audit uh, that comes in. Plus, uh, the same thing with uh, with 2.6. Plus, it, from the the monthly financial reports that you get from the quarterly uh, facilities reports that you get. Um, one of the things, because it, it's been mentioned lately, is the surpluses. So, provision number two. Um, you know, we have not overspent our accounts. The fact is, the is is there because we have a five hundred and twenty nine thousand dollars surplus, um, right? That's in the warrant. That's going to go in front of the town for for the vote on March fifth. Um, the important thing is recognizing where those surpluses come from um, and talking with Robin and doing a little investigation, the majority of those surpluses comes from people going out high, retiring, people getting hired well. And what's interesting is our surplus amounts have been the same when I was looking back, pretty, pretty much the same for the last four or five years. Well, that's because our attrition rate in terms of how many people are retiring has been about the same for those years. So I'm not 100% sure, but that data seems to indicate that, yeah, that's probably where it's coming from. 
the other piece, the smaller portion of it is, is the reimbursement system in the state. Um, in some cases, we have to plan ahead of time um, for costs, especially in special education. Um, we have to get them in the budget, um, charge the towns folks for them, even though we know we're going to get reimbursed for them after the fact. Um, sometimes they don't reimburse us till the end of the year. Um, so that's a smaller portion of the, where the surpluses come from. Um, last year's surplus was one million, um, but that was not all surplus. Um, it was about 450 to 500,000, just like this year's was. The remainder of it was because of the consolidation. There had been money in an OSSD account, right? Because you had all the separate little little boards at the time that had been building up for years and years and years. And that was the extra 500,000 last year. Um, the real surplus for us, it's just it comes out to be in the in the 450,000 dollar range. Um, provision number nine. Um, this. Uh, is a provision that says that uh, the superintendent is basically not allowed to leave any money that's owed to us unpursued. And the one issue that we had with that, you guys actually helped me out with at a, at a board meeting, I think in January, we had the one student whose family was un unable to pay the quarter of a year's tuition. And we it. So we are on that one as well. So the highlights from 2.3. Um, 2.6 is asset protection. It's pretty much the same thing. It's, it's protecting assets. Assets are more than money. Um, they are the facilities and pretty much anything that the district owns of value, um, which can include information. Um, provision 3, um, kind of point this out a little bit. Um, one of the things in um, this executive limitation requires the superintendent to make sure that we're taking care of our facilities so that we're not losing value so that we're anything that's going on. We're maintaining the value and the usability of those facilities. Um, in order to protect this, um, we are requesting another 217000 in the budget, which you guys have already moved in, to go specifically to facilities, the maintenance line. Um, and one of the reasons is because uh, there was a lot of maintenance that wasn't done in previous years. Um, in some cases, uh, what wasn't done required us to actually replace equipment and parts of facilities. Um, and then in other cases, some things haven't been done in a long time that should have been. Um, they're not critical yet, but if we don't kind of accelerate our work um, to get it done, um, we're gonna have some serious problems. So, so. I, I have a question about that. So the whole time that I was on the board with the prior superintendent, we were getting the similar sheets showing us priority this is what we're doing this is why we're doing it we're on schedule everything's fine so i'm kind of curious how all of a sudden now is again it could be or we look at your reports and we are like okay everything's hunky-dory and, and it's not so the, so the concerns me actually addresses to me so it might be worth taking a look and yeah. just so you know, I remember Paul and I brought this up in a board meeting three years ago. Yeah. And I, I was three challenging Angelo with this exact thing. Yeah, it's like, Paul. yep, how do we know? And it got, it, it was. You got shot down. Yes, I did. Yes. Uh, um, because how do we know we're just relying on, on the word of our superintendent, right? you know, to report to us and we're supposed to be hands off, so there's really quite a disconnect about what we can verify. Right. And I'm not an HVAC expert, right. so <laughs> I'm not going to be able to go in there. It hasn't been working in a building for five years, and people have been complaining it for about it for five years, and it hasn't been addressed. You know, there's something wrong with HVAC. And those right. are the situations that we were. Right, but we as a board you, didn't no, know about you didn't. it. And so uh, this might be That's worth me reading the two paragraphs here. Um, so the two provisions are provisions two and five of uh, Executive Limitation 2.8. And this really kind of gets to the heart of, you know, kind of what I've discovered and what I'm, I'm worried about on behalf of the board because you guys mm -hmm. are where the buck stops. Right. You're the ones mm -hmm. that are going to be held accountable aside from me. Um, if you're not getting the information you need. So there is a need for the board to consider further provisions to protect itself from two possible scenarios. First, a superintendent who intentionally fails to report significant issues happening within the district 
as part of the EL reporting process. Second, the actions of a superintendent or board member to prevent this or any pertinent information from becoming known to the whole board. Right, and you know, I, I think, you know, probably, oh, well, this is my proposal is that we ask Val at our mandatory training in March, <laughs> um, you know, how exactly do we plug this gap? In, if in I don't information. Put it in the report, you're never going to know, and so right. that's one of the re recommendations. Right, mm -hmm. and and really, we need to you know revisit these and you know have some better way to keep to have tabs on what the superintendent is reporting to us, you know, so that there aren't those gaps in our knowledge, and you know, because we are really under policy governance supposed to be hands off. <coughs> We're right. not supposed to be talking to the teachers and the right. mechanics and the facilities people. Right. But I wonder what I've been wondering about is maybe what it is is a matter of making sure you know because it, I'm I'm surprised sometimes when I speak with teachers they don't they don't even understand policy governance. And I'm wondering if if you're governing a system under a, a, a specific set of policies that have the the um, outline of sort of that's like you know the U.S. Constitution that tells us as citizens how we go about to make new laws or to have a voice in what's going on or to be heard, and you've got all of these folks down here have no idea how the system works, and. And I think that's part of the, maybe part of the problem. I, I don't know, because they don't know when to come to us as a board. Even the general public, which is more understandable, don't know when to come to the board and when things rise to the level of a board issue. The, there were, again, the two issues that need to be addressed um, are if, if I don't put something in a report, you're never going to know I didn't put it in a report. Mm -hmm. You're always able to challenge the veracity of what I physically put in there of because course. it's right there, it's in front of you, it's in writing. Mm -hmm. um, right. So you've got to have a way of identifying what's not in there. Easiest way, what, what, what's going on in the community? You guys had quite a bit happening in terms of community outcries. Um, and in terms, so it's... Not if, about the... the Building. Sure, we did. We about our facilities director. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had about the facilities director, but that was a that was a it, more of a personality mm -hmm. issue, and it was more that, than that. It was more than a personality issue. My suggestion, my recommendation on that is, when you hear the outcries, um, and it's been a, supposedly addressed, and you still hear the outcries going into four and five years, mm. it's time for you to take a look. Um, that's my recommendation. Val may come up with a better one um, than I. Piece, and that's sort of, you know, that, that's going on too long. If it's reached that yeah. sort of four or five years, right? It, yeah. yeah. But you got to find it. But the point is, is, is you got to find a balance between, okay, at what point are we crossing the line and stepping on toes versus just doing our, our diligence and, and mm -hmm. the, the diligence mm -hmm. piece. The other, other piece is making sure that um, everybody gets to speak mm -hmm. at the board meetings. When things are brought up, one person doesn't bully the others into silence. And that happened quite frequently. Um, I was a little bit shocked my first two times on the board that I saw it. And of course, I didn't know. I just thought that was, you know, being new and, and whatnot. That was just how things operated. But that, that wasn't the case now that I know some of the things that I know. Um, but it's making sure that folks on this board, um, no information is ever withheld from the full board. And the folks on this board, if they want to say their piece, they get an opportunity, just like with, with the community members. Um, doesn't mean that they get an hour to do it. Sometimes, you know, you go back to your Roberts rules and, okay, you, everybody gets their three to five minutes, but they get to say their piece. That way, at least everybody on the board gets to hear it and consider it. There were a number of times um, leading up to August where the board was intentionally kept out of the loop or forcefully kept out of the loop in terms of important information. And I'll leave it at that. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> thinking about both the financial and your age of plant, would that not be divulged in the audit when we meet with the auditors? So the, the problem with the audits, and again, this is, you know, I'm happy to, to help out with Val because she's, I don't have the best answers to things. I'm recognizing and, and communicating to the board that 
you've got some serious gaps in your ability to oversee what I do. Um, let's fix them, but I don't have the best recommendations. Um, ask the question here, I'm sorry. So um, in my experience, when we have auditors come in, they yeah. uh, work with every uh, leader appropriately and then they present to our board then there's executive session without the staff where they can ask about everything you're talking about right now and part of that is your age of plant it is the um, uh, technology you know um, the quality of the technology you know of course it's a hospital but um, so I'm curious with our auditors do they get deep into the weeds mm -hmm. and do we have that chance without you present to actually go through and meet with them and ask them about the ease of information, access to information, and what they discovered while they were here. You haven't, mm -hmm. but you should. Um, the problem that I see with these auditors, and I actually expressed it to them when I met with them, they, they kind of come in and they question me at the beginning of the year, is that they match paper to paper. Mm -hmm. This paper over here says that you know $1,500 was spent on this piece of equipment, and there's another piece of paper, you know, an invoice that says it was purchased, everything looks good. But at some point in time, what would have fixed the problem was when the $15,000 purchase request came in on this piece of paper, instead of depending upon the other piece of paper, going out and actually seeing if the piece of equipment actually So there's not a, a master ledger that is maintained with all that information on it? There was, but unless somebody goes out and actually looks to see that that physical piece is there, the maintenance was done, the piece was replaced that they paid the 15 grand for, you're not going to know. So somebody actually has to take that piece of paper and say, oh, it says that they purchased 30 new desks. Let's go and see if there are actually 30 new desks in that classroom. I don't that know if that... That doesn't happen? I'm sorry, I don't that's know if it's supposed to. to it shouldn't have to happen. Um, but I'm well, telling but you right now, I mean, I it's a blind spot that, that, as a board, you have. Um, and it's something that, you know, it doesn't have to be everything, but you know what, it might, might, might not hurt that, you know, anytime you spend more than $60,000 on something, somebody goes out and takes a look and makes sure the darn thing is actually Well, wouldn't there. that be your responsibility? We're delegating to you to manage... You're right, but again, we go back to the other other possible issues if I don't report it to right. you. Right. I think there has to be a second set of eyes. I, I know for us, I mean, you have to have your checks and balances on and you're, everything And you're you coming do. out of a unique, a unique situation. I'll leave it at that. Um, again, none of this stuff... There knows, aren't, because again... It never happened. I'm going back to what we were told previously as board members that... There are several sets of eyes that are looking at things that come through in that district office. But they have to be eyes of integrity. Well, and I'm assuming that you're hiring and you're evaluating your employees for those very things. That's a, that's a good assumption. Doesn't mean it's, it's correct in all cases. And I'm, I'm talking in general. You can get, you can hire a stinker in who's not going to do any of that stuff or who's going to purposely mislead. You have to be protected in that case. You have to protect yourself. Right. So what, how do you need to change those executive limitations to take that into account? I've given a couple of recommendations in there, um, but I'm not the expert in policy governance. Um, that's why Val, you know, be the right. good thing. Best thing to do is to go in with these two scenarios that I presented to Val and say, hey, how do we, how do we protect ourselves? How do we change the, the limitations of the, our other policies so we protect right. in these cases should they occur? I have one more question. Sorry. Yeah. I'm kind okay. of stuck no, on no. the audit no, piece no. of it. No, no. Yeah. Um, do you go out every so often to do an RFP, RFP to get a different audit firm in here so it's not the same audit firm time and time again? Yes, we did. We did we, we, Recently. Yeah, we Every year. It changed, yeah. But they, well, they used the same one for the last couple of years. The we had we had a, a, a one for maybe ten years, and then we have he actually retired, and now we have a new firm. And I think this is going to be his second, second year, right? Year. It's just second year. But is there is. A, pol a policy around that to say every two? I mean, I don't think it had to be every year, but every three years or whatever, you go out to bid again. I think what you're pointing out, Lane, are a lot of people made assumptions, um, mm -hmm. assuming confidence and clearly those assumptions were made in error so I think an external agency coming in appropriately is going to be able to uncover those quickly 
And, and for me, sitting in this position, I want you to be doing those checks. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not worried about me whatsoever. It doesn't mean I can't make a, an honest mistake. But in case I'm not here, and you get somebody else coming in, or you know, you get three superintendents down the line at some day, there's always the chance you're going to get somebody who's not. And that's, uh, you got to be prepared for that. Um, you got to be prepared for that. I think, Ashley, and you'd be a great one to be here. I think next month we have the yes. auditor report. Um, so we can quiz yeah. them. Um, <laughs> all you, you know, I think that would be helpful for us. Yeah. Because it. But my limitation I saw with them, like I said, is they, they were making sure yeah. the papers matched. Right. But, but right. in the case where we're making big purchases, folks didn't go out um, and, and actually check. The maintenance on RAS, the reason the heat was bad when I started up is because no maintenance had been done on it. They hadn't even replaced the filters in so long that when the heat kicked on, they were so clogged up, the filters got sucked into the machine and you were damaging the machine. Um, there were valves and vents that should have been replaced every five to six years that had never been touched and they couldn't, the valves wouldn't turn when they were supposed to send the heat to where it was needed. You had a, that was the reason the high so, school. So uh, I'm going to go back to. <laughs> I, I, I paid 180000 for new we have, we have, we have Brent managing program. this system. So, so hopefully we have a setup. You're the manager of this huge organization. You have your director of maintenance. Was there no uh, was there no evaluation of him? Was there no sort of following up? I mean, that is your responsibility as the manager of the system to be managing your people. There's a reason why the past director didn't last more than two weeks with me. It was that apparent coming in. Hmm. Okay. Well, this we is a, this is some interesting news. <laughs> weren't you here? No. 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 Just, I haven't been on the board. Well, you guys, you guys tried to actually talk about it in a meeting, in the board meeting. It was yep. either my first board mm -hmm. meeting or my first second. Or second. Mm -hmm. yep. It was actually brought up. How come we didn't know? Right. Folks were shut down from talking. Yes. Let's move on. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, we're not going to solve problems. No, I no. Some but it, it's, you've uh, got some yeah. areas of liability. And we can check. Can, can I right. ask, I mean, in terms of an audit, I mean, usually I think of an audit as a financial analysis, right, looking at accounts right. and stuff like that. Right, right. This, this is seems, more a management yeah, issue. Yeah, and so that, I mean, I, is, I think we're thinking that in that direction, but I just want to flag that to say I think this is more than the traditional kind of audit. Right. This is so like, what do you have a plant ledger? I mean, your plant ledger is on that. Um, and we have to go through and we have to actually say, you know, is that desk still in service? So the, our accounting office manages all of that because that is an asset to the organization, mm. yeah. which is on yeah. your balance sheet. Okay. And so they have to either take stuff off the ledger or add it too. And then your mm. auditors come in and they, they could very well spot check it, you know. But like same for like donors, they randomly choose 10 donors and they send them a letter and say, did you really make this donation? You know, um, is this legit? So they're checking all those yeah. records. Yeah. So for me, if I no longer have that computer, they know it because mm. it's all managed, which I would assume an organization of this size with that type of money, you're, you'd have those same controls. Yeah, in place. And I mean, it's our accounting office. It's our it's all the other offices as well. So it's not just one person who's saying this yeah. is legitimately happening because that those are your assets of your organization, which are mentioned in here. Mm -hmm. That's right. why I would assume that that all would be noted in an audit that I could then question an external auditor on. Hmm. One of the things that I was, and again, it, it may have to do with like the policy governance piece coming in, um, was the first time that people wanted to dispose of old equipment. Um, they came in, and I ran around. And I was asking people, "Well, geez, don't you have to?" Um, claim it as surplus and have the board vote on the disposal of it. And I'm like, no, we don't do that either. So we have to remove it, right, from your... Yeah, and, but, yeah. But, but, but the purpose behind that isn't, you know, in thinking about what you're saying, the purpose behind that happening in, in, in other districts that I've been in wasn't to micromanage, it was part of tracking what came in and what right. was going, and so that everybody mm -hmm. knew, you know, if it was no longer here, where the heck to go? Well, yeah, on, on the right. state, we, we agreed that it should be thrown away or it should be donated to the school or... So, you but they're know, your assets. Right. That's right. what you own. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what makes you. Um, do, have I seen schools that keep that detailed a list of? Uh, no, but doesn't mean it couldn't be done. 
um, or in in this case again it's appropriateness I, I don't know right. but that's part of the ELA feel I mean mm -hmm. you guys have a blind spot right now my recommendation is that I told you what I think the two of them are based on my experience mm -hmm. and, um, you know, really have a conversation with Al about it yeah, so, yeah I'm hurt. thanks thank you and so it goes without saying that it it's important that everyone review these um, reports carefully before our next meeting um, there are background materials in the OSSD office. <coughs> Just go ahead. Um, you can that's, make a, a, a an appointment a with with Lane too yeah. if you want to, you know, chat about any of these things in more detail. Please do that before our next meeting. Now, I have, in terms of this, with the exception of these two reports, the other reports we were trying to actually put the evidence in there. At any time, you can go. Hey, even if it's not something I've quoted as evidence, say, hey, I'd like to see a copy of. As long, as long as you give me a day to pull it out, if it's not something we've got right on, on file, you are welcome to review any of that stuff anytime. Um, and don't ever be afraid to do that. Um, so. Right. It really it really requires due diligence on all of our parts to, to you know, be reading mm -hmm. these things and, and poking around in them. you got, me, select, if you got them. me selecting all the evidence. Right. Exactly. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is our job. Lord, can I ask, um, I'm wondering with the communication and support of the board, was... Um, uh, <clears throat> Wasn't there some conversations around communication and, um, you know, as the, the role of the superintendent and superintendent's office in supporting the board and communicating out to the general public, whether it's meetings or, um, you know, it, it, other information that we want to get out? Um, would an amendment to any of the policies be appropriate to consider at the next board meeting or? I mean, we're just looking at the report right now, but I'm just wondering. Right. So you, so you're suggesting sort of adding an, an additional. Well, I think I feel like there's been a lot of conversation around communication out to you know to the owners and to the public, right. and so I'm wondering, you know, if that review process. And I don't have the language right now, nor do I have a proposal on the table. But I'm wondering, in terms of that conversation, is that something that w would be amended? as a part of the review process of this report? Or? Well, it seems to me, although I could be wrong, but it seems to me that would better fit under communication with the uh, parents oh, and community. Yeah. I think it's like two point, I right. can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is another six. one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, where yeah. it's, it's communication to the school and, and, and parents and community. So something like that, I mean, it's certainly worth considering. Yeah. I think probably, I mean, we've talked about it for years that, we, you know, we'd like you know, the superintendent's office to be doing some of that, so. Right. How do we, how can we flag that for? You, as a board, you have the right to adjust those limitations of those policies. Yeah, right. right, right. So, I don't, do we have a proposal as far as like when we want to add that to well, our agenda? Maybe, maybe we want to, again, have that conversation with Val. Yeah, I was going to say, why don't we look at um, April? March 20th, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, March, March 20th, 20th, 6 to 9. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the one we've been talking about literally for years. Right. So <laughs> why don't we make that the first one we yeah. uh, okay. tackle? So make it April. And so March, we can maybe we talk about it with Val, see yeah, if she has some good that. ideas. While it's still fresh in our mind, come mm -hmm. back the next month and try to tackle it. And it might be a multi-month process. Might not might not get done in April, but I mean, we can start it and then... See where it goes. Only thing I ask is just don't beat me up for the whatever happened in the past. <laughs> hold, me, hold me accountable. I want you to know anything that you want to know and see anything that I'm I'm doing, but just don't make the job so untenable that yes, you know, of course, that right. And I don't right. support you in anything that you ever want to see or look at. I should have nothing to hide. Okay, um, are we ready to move on? All right. Um, next, uh, we need to re uh, we have the consent agenda. We need to approve the minutes from the OSSD meeting on January 14th. Those are enclosed. Um, um, are there any additions or changes to those minutes? Mm -hmm. 
Secondly, we have the professional staff contracts. Are those just what you wanted me to the sign? The ones you signed, okay. yeah. Okay. So can I have a um, motion to pass, to move the consent agenda? I'll move to pass the consent agenda. A second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, next is superintendent's report. Um, do you have anything to comment on, add, or clarify, Lane? Uh, a couple of incidentals, unless there's questions. Mm -hmm. that's in there. Um, the, the Brookfield budget meeting um, that's scheduled uh, for Wednesday, depending upon what the weather is, just give mm. you a heads up after the public. <laughs> yeah, I'll make the call tomorrow if we're going to need that date. Um, right now it's 15 inches of snow and uh, 50 mile an hour wind blowing from the ground. So we'll see what happens. But I'll try to make that call by <laughs> early afternoon tomorrow so people can, can plan and get the message. My favorite. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, at least it's going to be snow. Yeah. But then it's going to rain, I guess, later on. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, the, the financial piece, um, talking with Robin today, her exact words were in very good shape. Um, mm. And I said, well, what makes you think that? And she said, well, because we can actually compare this year's budget to last year's because both are under the consolidated system. Ah. Um, mm. She said, you know, we spent a little bit more in terms of facilities than, than, than we did last year, but by the same time, we more than made up with it um, in terms of the new revenues from the, the tuition from all the students that we had in the majority of the district. Um, How's the uh, meal plan problem? Is that any better than what it was where it was off every month? It's uh, it's still off every month. We actually made it into the made it into the black at the end of last year, like we predicted. Right. Um, I was talking <laughs> about that today. I think it's down it's down negative seventy nine thousand. That's because there's a, a there's a month missing. Um, mm -hmm. Winters are slow, but it's actually not as low as it was this time last year. Okay. Okay. We're we're on par. It's not, not certainly not going to be worse, but it looks like it'll probably be better if things. Because, you know, when you look at negative 79,000, that's concerning. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if it's a historical, yeah, it's but if it's a historical same. trend, then it's not concerning because it comes out in the end. Yeah, I've got to tell you, for the first year through seeing some of those numbers, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I was relying on faith with, uh, with Robin. Nope, but always balances out. Um, so she was pretty good. Um, we made the last payment um, on Randolph Elementary School. Of $290,000. Wow. The building is completely paid off at this point. Nice. Um, other incidentals, uh, the lead update. Uh, we actually replaced all the faucets um, that were in the sinks in the classrooms. Uh, they went in and they did further testing. No issues. So it looks like it was definitely the faucets uh, in the classrooms that were causing the, the lead spikes. Um, they picked up a faucet in the kitchen, um, which ended up showing some lead. We don't think that's the faucet because that faucet was replaced. Mm -hmm. So the okay. issue may be the pipes. Um, it may be older piping in the building. Um, this is Brookfield, right? This is Brookfield. Um, so the plan is is uh, we've got some folks coming out to give us a, a best estimate of what the cause is. Cheapest solution is actually just to run a new set of piping um, in place of the old. Now, are you, are you going to just go for it and then see if the state will... Given this well, I'm, whole I'm bill kind of thing, a now, <laughs> because we're already supplying all the water for Brookfield, right? Right. That, that was that was one of the pieces when we talked about why wasn't that done nine years ago? But we'll leave that alone. Um, we're already supplying all the water for for Brookfield, um, so I may wait. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is they're talking. And I should have brought it up tonight. They're talking about lifting the moratorium on matching funds for building the school building. Mm. We're talking about the raging project. Mm -hmm. Oh, ooh. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if we can get the shell up, at least, and get those folks into the, um, the warehouse by the school, and then once... As a temporary as thing. As a temporary, mm -hmm. once the, uh -huh. the potential matching funds come in from the state, if they remove that moratorium, then we can complete the work on the shell that we built. So we were kind of bouncing that around. But they've got the um, architects kind of revamping um, what they're looking at in terms of the, in terms of the building of what, what will it take to bring the kids into the uh, the warehouse by the right right uh, by the OSSD office and just build the shell out there for storage um, and then what we can
can do, as I said, you know, the thing you could do, even if we don't get the matching funds, is you get the shell up, you, you get the thing, it's all nice and insulated, you use it for your storage, and then every year you take a chunk of the surplus fund, and in five years you got everything up where you mm -hmm. right. right. It's just a long-term project, and that way you don't have to go to the town and ask for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could they do that work on the warehouse? And to house the kids, could they do that work over the summer? I've, told, I've to told them I want. Yeah, I've told them I want the kids moved um, before next year, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I've got big concerns about the building. Um, yeah, that that they're able to do. Okay. That should be easy enough. And that's one of the reasons we're focusing in on that building is because it's pretty much ready made. Got to got to put in the, the classroom space. Got to put in the kitchen. Right. It's not as big as we'd hope, but you know what? It's It'll a do. beautiful it's space. Than yeah. That's sort of the purpose. Those are the incidentals. Mm -hmm. Uh, one interesting thing that happened at the RTCC meeting, of which it has a, like a 12-member board, and I was the only one who went. Oh. <laughs> so that was interesting. Yes. Um, but uh, we are going to, um, Jason and Lane are really rethinking how that board is set up and how are we going to get input from these sending schools. So it, we're required to have four meetings a year. Um, but the last meeting only had two or three. Um, and it's been it's been a nagging problem, and it just keeps on mm -hmm. getting worse. So um, they're it, going it's to. It's never had any real true attendance, I mean, for the pattern. Well, it's gotten worse. Yeah, it mm. like, I mean, before, yeah. there was usually like one person from Williamstown and, <coughs> yeah. and maybe someplace else. But yeah, it's, it's, never it's really been. pathetic. Um, they don't really feel like they have a, vo they need a voice in the running of RTCC. And, and so something we need to, we were talking about how to change it so that it was a meaning, more meaningful mm -hmm. input that we're asking people to give. It makes sense. So that's a work in progress. Are they appointed by their boards from the sending town? Yeah. But then people just don't they show up. They never show up. Mm -hmm. And then there are a few other people like someone from, um, What's Kate? It's not VSAC that Kate oh, represents. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Yeah, is it VSAC? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Kate. Okay, Kate's from oh, VSC. No, it's CCV. 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 Oh, maybe she's CCV. Is it Kate yeah. Hughes? Yeah. yeah. Kate Hughes comes uh -huh. all the way up here. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Oh wow. She almost always comes, but yeah. she didn't on this last meeting. Um, and then there's some business people mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and, business, and of course the school yeah, reps. Yeah. So anyway, it's um. It's mostly the sending school boards. Usually, right. the only one I remember showing up on a regular basis was Williamstown. Right. And then the, all the other school boards. Northfield, I've never seen. I don't yeah. think I've well, Williamstown, North Northfield are now one. Right. Mm -hmm. So whoever's showing up from she, North. Yeah, no one has show, or shown from up. Williamstown is supposed to represent both now. Hopefully. Presumably. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Um, anything else? Any other incidental information? Uh, other potential big things coming up in terms of facilities, um, the water supply to the, this building here. Um, they may still need to do that water upgrade even though we're not um, potentially going to do the full Raven um, mm -hmm. recreation over there because uh, the water supply, the, the actual pipes that supply the water to this building were designed for before it was added on to. I don't know what year that was, probably 67, 68, somewhere yeah, in there. Yeah, something about that. Um, and it just, it's not, it's not a sufficient supply. They've got to put bigger pipes in and double up the pipes. Mm -hmm. um, so that may be something that's coming, um, as, as I know a little bit more about, and I'll let folks know if that work absolutely has to be done and what the cost potentially would be. Um, that's about it. All right. Um, we didn't do a board evaluation tonight. And do we need an executive session? Unless you want one. All right. Well, look at this. Kate's <laughs> last meeting, and we're done at 8.40. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>